Good morning, everyone. So my name is Jen, and I'm working at the Dan Demai School. Uh, it's my great pleasure to host and introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Lin Bao Wang. Dr. Wang has been the professor and the director in a program in emerging infectious diseases at Duke NUS Medical School, uh, Singapore, since 2012. Dr. Wang obtained his PhD from UC Davis, and then he moved to the Commonwealth Scientific and Industry Research Organization, Australian Animal Health Laboratory in 1990. Then in, 19, uh, in 2010, Professor Wang was elected uh, was the um, Fellow of Australian uh, Technology, Science and Engineering. Dr. Wang is well known for his work of, of discovering the bat to human link of SARS virus back in 2003 and is currently involved in getting to the bottom of ongoing pandemic such as uh, developing serological tests to test SARS-CoV-2 and the early and successful culture of the virus from the infectious patient's sample. He is also serving as a member of multiple WHO committees on COVID-19. So personally, I met with Dr. Wang, I think last year um, at the American Society for Biology and I really enjoyed and was impressed by his talk and also we have the in-person chatting for a long time in one of the afternoons. So today he's presenting bats as a reservoir of emerging zoonotic viruses. The presentation will provide a review of major emerging zoonotic viruses outbreaks in the last decades, including SARS-CoV-2, of course. Uh, it also covers Dr. Wang's last findings on bat biology and immunology, which may explain bats' unique status as an excellent virus reservoir. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wang and hear what he has to say today. And also please put your box after the presentation. So, all right, I, sh I guess I should hang over the control to Dr. Wang now. All right, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Jen. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we met last year at the ASV and I was commenting that I said, you know, I have traveled to most of the university and give lectures. So Yale is the place I really want to go. And he said, why don't you come next year? I said, okay, I will be there in 2020. But unfortunately with COVID-19, I can still cannot be there physically. So I hope that as soon as the uh, uh, travel ban is lifted, I can be there physically. Yeah, so what I decided to do is really, you know, give a very broad talk. And I realized, you know, you guys, many of the uh, uh, people in the audience are not really infectious disease of our virologist. So I will go broad, uh, but I hope that give you some kind of a, a new information and also put it in the context of COVID-19. So. It's the bats and the reservoir of emerging viruses, but with a focus, of course, on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. So, you know, uh, Jane already really explained my career. So I was trained at UC Davis. My uh, PhD is in biochemistry and molecular biology. So I have zero training in infectious disease. Accidentally, I got a job in the CSR Australian Animal Health Laboratory, and this the the photo you see, it's the world's largest bowel containment BSA-4 facility. So imagine, you know, you have a BSA-3, you can do mouse experiment. This is a BSA-4 and we can do horse experiment. You know, so my claim of fame is we developed a vaccine, the first licensed vaccine against the horse virus, hangover virus, I will describe a little bit. And then 2012, I was a headhunter to, to be the uh, uh, director of the Emerging Infectious Disease Program at the Duke and Yes Medical School. So this is a joint venture between the Duke Medical School and the National University of Singapore. And uh, so I sort of moved from animal health to human health. And as a package idea, any director that, you know, want to be a director in this school, you have to be a professor at a Duke. So that, you know, I was uh, forced to be a professor at the Duke Global Health Institute. And uh, that really sort of made me from animal health to human health to global health, which kind of, uh, it's my natural progression of my career. So what I try to decide to really uh, tell you, you know, a more a story of my life and also my career and then a little bit of science in between. So I will give you a quick review of the major zoonotic virus of confirmed or suspected bat origin because there's always a debate, is Ebola from bats? You know, for me, I'm convinced it's from bat, but for some scientists to say, you know, show me the evidence and then just one slide to say, you know, what did I do for COVID-19? Actually, I was in Wuhan in January on Ground Zero. And then to me, who have been working in this for a quarter century, 
I think you know COVID nineteen is not unexpected. We have been expecting this. You know, we have been predicting this will happen. But I guess you know the international community was not ready, and I think the scale of the outbreak, the spread of outbreak, still I think is way beyond even I can you know predict. The debate is still on the virus origin and the early transmission event. You know, where is this from? You know, I mean, what I don't like is it's getting a little bit political. As a scientist, you know, I will tell you the story that I actually solved that problem for SARS. And so for SARS-2, I think we can contribute as well. And then, you know, keep coming to bats, right? Why bats are such a good reservoir. So I hope, you know, I, uh, uh, maybe this will be a focus of my talk. I will, the major science is really mm -hmm. right now, before COVID-19, my group is 80% on bat biology and immunology rather than on virus. But with COVID-19, now we're 80% on the virus. Okay, so this point I really want to stress, you know, it's not bats fault. Bats have been around with the virus for 60, 70 million years, you know. So, and they carry virus without disease, right? So I have been asking myself and I try to contribute to say, you know, I have did a lot of work to identify bat ball viruses, but uh, it's not bats fault. And now we try to say, can we really turn this source of the virus, bats, into a source of lessons and solutions for human medical challenges? And then the last part is really, I want to contrast COVID-19 as an emerging zoonotic virus, different from SARS, different from MERS, different from Ebola, because COVID-19 looks like it's going to stay with us for a long time. So now we have a new challenge, what we call reverse zoonosis. Basically, it's human to animal transmission. So this is uh, my 25 years, basically, you know. As I said, I have no training in virology, but I was fortunate enough to land a job in the Australian Animal House Laboratory in Australia, Geelong. And then three and a half years later, we had this mysterious virus called a hangar virus emerged. And, uh, uh, you know, in Australia, you know, uh, uh, involved 20 horses and two, two humans, and with a case fatality of 70%, that's a big event. You know, the government really, you know, security scientists, doctors, vets just got into it. And so I was fortunate enough to be uh, put in charge of to unravel the genome of the virus. You know, that's in 94. You know, nowadays, you know, when you say I solved the genome of the virus, that's nothing. In 94, that's a lot. You know, we solved the genome of totally unknown virus in, in three months. And then I renamed the virus as Hendra virus. Initially it was called the equine mobility virus because we thought it was a mobility virus like measles and from horses. It's actually a new virus. And now we, uh, I named the genus called the Hannibal virus in the paramyxial virus family. And uh, it's not a horse virus because horse is an intermediate host is a bat virus. Then five years later, another much bigger virus outbreak in Malaysia and Singapore involve you know, 265 people and the mortality, case fatality 40%, a pig is the intermediate host. And then, I mean, with COVID-19 now, hopefully everybody in the audience also know about the SARS coronavirus one, you know, SARS coronavirus in 2002. So I led a WHO mission and eventually we uh, discovered that this is a, a bat virus as well and used civets as intermediate host. And then 2012, we had this Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus and uh, camel is the, the, the intermediate host. Ebola has been around for at least four to five decades, but 2014 was the largest Ebola outbreak. And we believe it's a bad uh, reservoir and COVID-19, of course, I will be talking much more that we also believe it's a bad bone virus, although the intermediate host is still unknown. Ever since the discovery, you know, so as I said, you know, uh, uh, in the WHO, I was uh, uh, in charge of leading the discovery of uh, bats as the reservoir for SARS-related coronavirus, right? So it's not only SARS, but SARS-related coronavirus. And we had also, you know, we published in 2018 serology evidence to say the spillover of uh, SARS-related coronavirus from bats to human happens more frequent than we thought, but not every one of them will cause a major outbreak. It may cause just a few mild sickness in a village. Of course, you will not know. But when we did the serology surveillance in southern China, you know, in the Yunnan province, we did find evidence of uh, spillover. Okay, so we have been really predicting that you know that it can happen again because if you look at the uh, coronavirus family tree, so this is like a ten years old, you know, uh, and you look at this, it's all bat coronaviruses, and then the one in red is the human SARS coronavirus. 
So my group and many other groups have been concentrating on this uh, branch called the SARS-related coronavirus. And we thought the next, you know, a, a spillover will come from here. You know, so I, I was working for WHO. WHO was asking, the Chinese government was asking, Australian government was asking, Singapore government was asking, where SARS come back? You know, so if they want my answer, my answer is definitely yes. I said, it's pretty certain that this type of virus will spill over again. The only thing I don't know is when and where. I mean, when is easy to understand. You cannot predict precise which year. Where in two different sort of a, a context. One is on this phylogeny tree, the family tree. I could not predict where the virus, you know, is most likely to spill over. You would think this is the branch, right? We had a SARS, but this kind of a related virus will uh, uh, also spill over. The other is geographically where it's hard to predict, right? Whether it's Southern China or, you know, Middle East or somewhere, you know, uh, uh, in South America, you know, Africa, they, they're all possible because bats, bats are all over the world, you know, uh, other than maybe the Antarctic, you know. So 2012, when MERS can, you know, uh, emerge in Middle East, I was really shocked for two reasons. One is that Middle East was not a hostile. And secondly, on this family tree, as you can see, although they are, you know, all coronaviruses, but it's very distant related to the most dangerous SARS coronavirus at that time. So from there on, you know, I have been predicting, say, if SARS can jump and kill human, and most can, how about all the viruses near this cluster in between, right? So it's very hard to predict. And uh, the Straits Times, you know, that's the equivalent of New York Times in, in Singapore. So the science journalist uh, interviewed me in 2013 after the most coronavirus and asked me to really, you know, make a prediction. I'm a very conservative scientist, but I have been working the field for long enough. So for this, you know, I really break with my conservatives and I made a prediction. I said, I can bet with my life on it. You know, almost certain that in the next 10 years, you know, a new killer virus spread by bats will emerge. As a scientist, if you can, you know, uh, uh, prove your prediction is true, you should be happy. But in our profession, unfortunately, if your prediction is fulfilled, it means people have to die. And uh, so for COVID-19, then, you know, we just passed a million uh, 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 people sort of sacred, uh, basically lost their life. And, you know, argue to say that's a fluke, right? You know, because it's a media interview and you just be uh, provocative. It's not because we have been prepared this for, for years, you know. So this is a 2016, I won a grant, you know, uh, uh, the National Research Foundation in Singapore. The title is Combating the Next SARS or Most Like Emerging Infection Disease Outbreak by Improving Active Surveillance. So this is the serology molecular and also virus isolation. And last year in current opinion in virology, I just put a review that virus impacts and a potential spillover to animal humans. And the editor want me really, you know, to, to say to predict among these known unknowns, right? When SARS first emerged, we did not know coronavirus can be so deadly. So that was a, a unknown unknown. But now coronavirus really is the un, uh, known unknown. So the editor want me to really sort of uh, predict which one is the most dangerous in the known unknown, most likely to have another spillover events and that future outbreak. And I say it's going to be back coronavirus. So that's just like four months before the COVID-19. So, so again, I just try to emphasize for people like us working in this field, you know, this is uh, COVID-19 is totally expected. What's not expected is that the international community really, to, in my view, did not do a good job. And, uh, you know, the scale, uh, the spread right now and the damage is just, to me, is uh, much worse than necessary. So just, you know, in terms of for those of you not virologists, you know, emerging virus from bats so far are dominated by RNA viruses. Uh, it's not because they, bats only carry RNA virus, bats also carry lots of DNA viruses, but we know that RNA viruses, you know, has a, 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 the replication process has a, polymerase has a low fidelity. So RNA viruses usually is prone to mutation that offers them advantage in terms of, of finding new hosts. So spillover events is uh, usually associated with uh, RNA viruses. So, you know, in the last 25 years, I have been involved in many, many of the discovery of these kind of events, and it can be summarized in four different virus family. We start 94, you know, the Hanger virus and the led to the Nipper virus. So this is a negative strand, non-segmented RNA virus uh, in the family Paramyxoviridae. 
And then the Ebola virus, you know, uh, most people are very familiar. It's a filoviridae. It's in the same order. So it's both are non segmented next stranded uh, and uh, RNA virus. And then you have the SARS, MERS, you know, and COVID 19. This is in the coronaviridae. It's positive sense RNA virus. I don't have the time to go into it, but it's worth to mention that RNA viruses, by the nature of this high sort of uh, 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 error rate of replication, you know, evolutionarily that there's a selective pressure against large genome. So like the flu virus, you know, the total genetic content is quite, you know, uh, 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 decent, but it's into eight segment. You know, RNA virus has a new way of, a, a, a normal way of, a, a smart way of doing things is by segmented RNA, you know, genome so that you can uh, uh, sustain the selective uh, evolution pressure. Whereas coronavirus is unique. It's a single strand single strand of positive RNA virus, and the genome is the average around 30 kilobase. So it remains to be the largest single strand RNA genome. You know, I don't have time to go into it, whether this, you know, uh, play a role on why bats are such a good reservoir for coronavirus rather than other mammals. You know, I have a theory, but I don't want to touch this. Uh, I would just, you know, mention it here. And then the last family we discovered is a, a zoonotic virus that caused severe disease, but no deaths yet in human, is this class of rear virus. We call the ortho rear virus from bats. It's in the rear viridae, and the, the, the really representative of this is a Malacca virus we discovered in Malacca in Malaysia. But these are double-stranded virus. So as you can see, you know, we cover positive strand, next strand, double strand RNA viruses. And uh, I always say, you know, this is only scratch the surface. Bats carries many, many more virus, and it's only a matter of time, you know, they will jump and cause zoonotic transmission and outbreaks. Okay, so for COVID-19, you know, uh, uh, I was in sort of a few WHO meetings, and somebody reminded me to say, Linfa, did you realize that you're the on only non-retired EID scientist who has experienced all the major emerging zoonotic sort of bat virus events from Hanja to COVID-19. So from 1994, I guess 1994, I was old enough to be the senior scientist and then 2020, I'm still young enough to, to be not retired, you know. So, so I consider that fortunate enough for myself to, to do all this. And then January 14th, 18th, I was on ground zero in Wuhan by accident uh, because I serve as the scientific sort of a chairperson of their scientific advisor board for the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and that's, you know, in the news a lot. And uh, so I basis, so I happened to be there for their annual retreat, and uh, the, uh, the air ticket was booked before I realized there was a new outbreak. So, you know, so I did not go there to investigate the outbreak, but of course, you know, uh, you're on the ground, and so I will tell you a few stories. And then I came back to Singapore, and I realized that, you know, uh, after the shutdown of the Wuhan city, I thought I got out 2018 and then they shut down the city on 23rd. And so that night I just, you know, told my dean, I said, I'm gonna self quarantine myself. So at that time, the Singapore government has not started the quarantine. So I will be the first person in Singapore went into quarantine because of COVID-19. And then I was appointed to many com committees with WHO and OIE, not OIC, the uh, uh, World Animal House, uh, Committee and the most intense committee is this WHO International Health Regulation Emergency Committee. So this the committee composed of 16 members, and of course all the debate you know is confidential. But we you know were responsible to to study everything and to examine everything and then to declare that whether this is a you know public health emergency of international concern, the fake event. So that was very tense, you know, and I'm in Singapore. So I have to attend meeting from 9, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m., you know, three days in a row. On the, on the Singapore, you know, national response team, then I was in charge, you know, uh, of the virology and the serology. Uh, as uh, Jen already said, we were the second country outside of China, isolated live virus. So that was four days after we had the first import case. And then within a month, we're using uh, the first country using serology to do uh, uh, contact tracing, you know. Last but not least, that 17 day quarantine also gave me the chance really to stay home to read all the media, social media and uh, uh, scientific, you know, and uh, the fact I can read both Chinese and English, I think really helped me to navigate through this 
COVID-19 response, not only scientifically, but policy and politics wise, you know, so that's, uh, so I just want to show you one photo, you know, so as I said, I was in Wuhan on January 14th and I left in the early morning of January 18th. There's a direct flight from Wuhan to Singapore. So this is the check-in uh, place, the gate. And, you know, this is before Chinese New Year, a lot of Chinese will come to Singapore for holiday. As you can see, 0%, 0% wear mask. This is January 18th, okay? Uh, the reason is that the, at least the authority has maintained that, you know, this novel coronavirus outbreak of severe pneumonia so far at that time, there's no strong evidence of significant human to human transmission. So this is a very diplomatic kind of language, right? No strong evidence of significant human to human transmission. So even for myself, you know, of course I would not go close to this. I was lined up in the last and I tried to really not mix with the, uh, uh, the people too close, but I, you know, because I thought what happens if somebody on the plane is already infected? Uh, interestingly, one lady on that flight was infected, but she was not showing symptoms. So five days later, I mean, she was the third imported case for Singapore, basically. Then just over, you know, 10 days later, less than two weeks later, January 31st, that was the last direct flight from Singapore to, or some from Wuhan to Singapore. And as you can see, still a lot of people, you know, plan is full, but everybody is wearing a mask, 100%. So this is something I think, you know, this is really the lesson. And I think the Chinese side really should have done better is really, you don't make a statement of no human to human transmission unless you have 100% evidence. You know, if we and the general public, if you, at least you warn people to say there are evidence of human to human transmission, but we don't know how readily it is, I think the situation will be very different in Wuhan and for the rest of the world. So this is uh, the point I try to make and just using that one slide. So now come back to this origin of virus, you know, so whether it's SARS, Ebola, MERS, you know, Nipple, Hanger, as soon as you have a human fatal case, you know, it's absolutely necessary, both from a scientific point of view and from public health and the future prevention point of view, is we need to know the origin and the early transmission event. Okay. So as I said already, so far, most of the backbone viruses have an intermediate host, right? Hanjo uses horse and the SARS is civet. And uh, for SARS-CoV-2, we still don't know, but we believe there's an animal, we call it animal X. And then in terms of origin, you know, uh, the closest virus, you know, published in Nature uh, in January by the Wuhan Institute of Virology is 96% identical, the whole genome. That's a pretty strong evidence and our contrast this with our SARS-CoV-1, you know, a, a study later. So in terms of intermediate animals, you know, what uh, animal X can be, right, you know, Early on, there was a one paper, you know, it's, an, it's really interesting. That paper is really not mainstream, but the news, you know, media just jump onto it. And uh, I have to spend a lot of time to say that's unlikely, you know. The paper basically says, you know, snake can carry coronavirus. Snake are sold in that live animal market in Wuhan. Hence, snake is the intermediate host. You know, it's, it's ridiculous because uh, you know, there are so many animals carries a, a, a coronavirus and there's so many animals sold on the market Then I will show you later. Personally, I think it's, it has to be a mammal, you know, if it's not a mammal, then I think I'll be really surprised. And pangolin right now is the front runner, but I, I think that, you know, possible, but I, I'm not convinced to say, you know, we have a conclusive evidence. So in terms of the, the uh, origin of the virus, you know, this is the paper published in early January. So Zhou Peng, the first author was my uh, uh, former uh, postdoc. He just went back to Wuhan Institute uh, 2016. And uh, uh, the senior author, Shi Zheng Li, uh, was my sort of long-term collaborator. And uh, she has been working with me on backbone virus for the last, you know, 15 years. So I just want to show this, you know, uh, 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 phylogeny. I mean, the paper is uh, out for a long time, but it's really important to appreciate this, you know. So you have all these coronaviruses, you know, the alpha and the beta, and these are the human coronavirus from Wuhan, the original novel coronavirus sequence. And this is the back coronavirus IATG13. So as you can see, 96% genome identity, and also it's much closer 
than any other viruses really you know SARS is is somewhere there right you know so so uh i think that, that it's pretty convincing that the closest cousin is in bats and it's a 96 percent and i'll come back to that number and then what we have is this uh, nature paper and there's several papers i don't have time to go through all of them just this is the nature paper you know uh, published in march 17th you know uh, maybe just two months after the uh, bat paper. So this is uh, the identify uh, SARS-CoV-2 related coronavirus in the Malayan pangolins. And uh, again, it's a phylogeny here. So this is the SARS cluster. This is the COVID-19 lineage and uh, human virus here. And uh, the red dot are the pangolins from Guangxi and Guangdong. So these are the two provinces in China, in Southern China. But interestingly, these are not native local uh, pangolins. These are Malayan pangolins. So it's uh, actually mostly are come from uh, 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 Southeast Asia. And uh, in theory, pangolin, you know, trading is illegal, but there are plenty of pangolins uh, in China. So that just, you know, I have been told that pangolin is the most illegally traded wildlife animal. The volume is huge, you know. So this is human virus, this is a pangolin virus, and then the, the bat virus is here. So it's still the bat virus is much closer. And the, the genome level is around the 90%, you know. Uh, somebody, I think you need to mute. I, I feel a little bit echo. And uh, so this is uh, uh, the bat virus and this is the pangolin virus. The other thing, you know, I will tell you later is, uh, you know, my personal experience is if you want to declare any animal play an important role, either as a reservoir or intermediate host, you know, you really need to do serology because uh, animals, just like human, you know, the, the virus will stay in the body, but not for long. But animal, the antibody stays much longer. So antibody is a much powerful, more powerful tool to do this kind of epi. And uh, I think, uh, you know, in this paper, the, the serology is very weak, you know. So for those of you who could not read Chinese, I apologize, but I have to show this because this is the menu of the wildlife so on this famous market called the Huanan Sea for the wholesale market in Wuhan. Itself is a misnomer. It's called a wholesale, you know, sea for the wholesale market, but it's not true because it is a wholesale, but also has retail. And uh, it sells seafood, but then they have many, many species, you know, uh, mammalian species sold, which are definitely not seafood. So I said they sold almost everything except pangolin, but I already told you, right? Pangolin is illegal. So I don't know whether they never sell, sold pangolin on the market or they sold a pangolin under the table and uh, without putting on this uh, uh, open menu, right? But civets, you know, the civets is sold both as a whole animal for 430 yuan, you know, that's around 20 US dollars, uh, and, uh, or a kilo of the meat for maybe 10 uh, uh, US dollars, you can buy a kilo. We know beyond any doubt, you know, civets are susceptible for COVID-19, you know, because it's for SARS-CoV and also has the right ACE2 receptor. So, so definitely there are more than just one animal in the market which are susceptible for the COVID-19. Before I go any further, I really want to bring back, you know, 17 years ago, you know, so we had this SARS outbreak, you know, that's the unknown unknowns. It started in November 2002. And by July 2003, so that, you know, about uh, nine months later, WHO declared the pandemic is over. But even then, we still did not know where the virus was uh, uh, from, you know. So I always say right now, there's so much debate about the virus origin and the scientifically and politically. And I said, people forgot, you know, it took us, you know, 10 months before we assembled a team, the mission to China, and it took us another two years to discover the origin, and that already considered to be very, very fast, you know. So this is the WHO mission that I was fortunate enough to, to, to be one of the eight international experts that hired by WHO, seconded by WHO to go there. So it's a WHO, FAO, Chinese government. And then from there, you know, we led to the really, the discovery, you know, uh, of the origin. But before we went to the bats, this was the uh, science paper publishing in May 2003. So for SARS, it's the opposite. For SARS coronavirus in 2003, the Hong Kong group identified civets as the intermediate and amplifying the transmitting host. 
So that was in May, before we even knew where this virus was from. And then the mission I went to China was August 2003. And then we published this paper in 2005. We have both serologic evidence and molecular evidence to really you know, a, a pinpoint down to bats are the natural reservoir of the SARS-like coronavirus. That was based on the sequencing and the serology. You know, that's what I'd like to uh, bring your attention. Remember the nature paper for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is 96% genome identity. The paper we published in 2005 is 88 to 92% genome identity, but it's step by far the closest coronavirus, you know, uh, to SARS-CoV uh, uh, exists uh, in the gene bank. It took us another 10 years, mainly from a professor in this lab in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Her team and herself has been going back to the same cave example like a, a three to four times a year. And then 10 years later, finally, the international group, you know, the same group, we were able to isolate a live virus. Now, you know, although bats carries a lot of coronaviruses, but are very hard to isolate live virus. So this is the first live virus isolated and that can use now ACE2 as a receptor. So I try to emphasize it's a 10 years of intensive sampling without any political in in interference. And we still get a 95% overall sequence identity and 96% identity in IBD, okay? So I will come back to that point later, you know. The outbreak for both SARS and COVID-19, definitely human outbreak, definitely started in China and there's a lots, lots of very intensive search in bats and looking for coronavirus for the last 15 years. And yet, we have not been able to find a 99.9% .9 identical coronavirus either for SARS or for COVID-19. So the question is, have we, try, uh, we haven't tried hard enough or actually due to this legal and illegal wildlife trading, the natural reservoir could be outside China. So I'll come back to this later. Now I'm going to switch to white bats, you know, so this is very quick review of the backbone virus. But in terms of science, most exciting for me right now is dig deep to ask the question why bats can carry all these so many different viruses, And when they jump, many of them are deadly in the last, you know, 30 years, definitely in terms of new emerging zoonotic virus of high fatality, most of them come from bats. Okay. So, you know, I was not a biologist, you know, I was a biochemist. So, uh, and I, you know, have no knowledge of bats until I started bat viruses. You know, these are the interesting bat facts, you know. 20% of living mammal on Earth, this is around over a thousand species, is a bat. Uh, in terms of species diversity, only second to rodents. And they're the only mammal that have a true flying capability and they're very well distributed except the human, right? We have airplane and uh, ships we can go anywhere. And then they have variable super regulations uh, either by season or by day, night and uh, daytime. And uh, you know, the uh, insectivorous bats can do eco location. They don't have a vision. So many, many interesting features, but the last three I think is the most interesting to me is that bats have a very long lifespan. A seven gram bat can live to 41 years. You know that if you translate to human years, that's a 1000 year. So they hold the world record for a relative longevity. And bats, you know, seldomly get tumor. So they are much less prone to, to uh, cancer. And then of course, you know, my study, you know, and others really open up this new chapter about identify bats as a very unusual and excellent reservoir of lots of viruses. And so these are the bat facts sort of, you know, biologically, but also bat during fly, you know, their physiology is amazing. Their metabolic rate can change, you know, surge to 34 of their resting rate within minutes. And their heartbeats can go to a thousand beats per minute. And the same bats in, in your part of the world, the northern uh, 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 part of USA, you know, you have this uh, myotis bat that, you know, it's a small bat during hibernation, the same bat, the heart beats six beats per minute. During fly is over a thousand. And the body temperature during fly can go all the way to 42 degrees C. Now, any human, imagine if you do any of this, you'll be dead, you know, within hours, right? You cannot sustain this kind of stress. So this is, I think, you know, to me that I got really interested about 10 years ago, try to understand why bats and whether 
this resilience to stress, adaptation to stress, you know, a, 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 a tolerance is also the contributor for bats to be such a good reservoir. And I think uh, we have found the answer that it is at least partially due to that reason. So as I said, you know, I've been working on bat bone virus for 25 years and about 10 years ago, you know, uh, 12 years ago, basically I made a, a career decision to say, you know, I cannot just study virus, we have to study bats. So then we were the first group into a comparative uh, a genome, uh, two bats, one large flying fox, this handsome flying fox from Australia, and another one is uh, Maotis bats from uh, 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 China. So, I mean, it's old paper, but we identify two really interesting discovery. There's overwhelmingly, very obviously, that compared bat genome and the other uh, terrestrial mammals, you find the two pathways are under strong positive selection. One to do with DNA damage repair. So bats, you have an enhanced mechanism to make this efficient. On the other hand, the other defense mechanism, which is inflammation, right, is uh, reduced, especially the over-inflammation. And I will come back later, right? In human disease, we always say that inflammation, you know, is uh, responsible for many disease. So then fast forward, you know, another uh, five years later, a Gustavus group published this paper in Cell. Basically, you know, they found the uh, uh, same thing is that to say in terms of this bat as a reservoir for Ebola virus, the difference is not antiviral. The antiviral human and a bat are similar. The difference is that we, when we get infection, our inflammation goes really high and sometimes overboard. And then, you know, start to come storm and so on. With bats, you know, have very, very controlled inflammation. So immunity published, uh, you know, uh, the same day, have this uh, uh, review basically uh, has a catch-in title called the Holy Immune uh, Tolerance of Batman. To me, the tolerance is only one part of the equation. I think a more uh, uh, accurate description is the Holy Immune Balance. So I will show you this later. In terms of uh, health, right, whether you're human bats, I think to get the healthy status is really about this balance. So in our body, we have this defense, the tolerance. If you don't have enough defense, you know, if cancer cell and a virus grow in your body and then it's unlimited and then, you know, they can kill you very rapidly. If you go over defense, then you can infect your disease, you know, uh, as uh, the cliche says, very few virus kills us, we kill ourselves or autoimmune disease. But no species, no animal is perfect. And also at the individual level, then we really fluctuate, fluctuate all the time, right? Sometimes we go over defense, sometimes we go under defense. So there is a homeostasis mechanism there, of course, try to bring this to, to do the balance. But in human, that range of fluctuation is much bigger than what happens in bats, okay? So this is something that we have found a few years ago, you know. These are defense genes. It could be interferon, hisho proteins, you know, efflux pump, you know, uh, steam molecules, you name it. And uh, in humans, we know that this defense gene usually don't need to be switched on until you see a danger signal. The inducer, inducer one is a chemical treatment, inducer two is a, 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 a sender virus. So when you see a, a danger signal that, you know, they can do logs of induction, whereas in bats, you know, that induction is within one or two logs. So the range is much more controlled and that's why less likely, less prone to over uh, immunopathology and overinflammation, and that's less disease and make them much healthier. So I don't have the time that in the last, you know, uh, eight years or so, since I came to Singapore, we have published many papers to demonstrate uh, aspects of uh, back kind of a, a defense tolerance balance. On one hand, we have demonstrated this elevated basal level of defense mechanism, more efficient DNA damage, high basal level of certain interferon gene and the ISGs. Heat shock proteins, you know, heat shock protein is supposed to be a stress shock protein, but in bats, it's always on, even if you incubate a cell at 37 degrees. And we accidentally found also one uh, efflux pump, the ABC transporters, you know, for cancer biologists in the audience you might be familiar with, you know, that's overexpressed in, in cancer sort of treatment uh, resistant, drug resistant patients, cancer patients, whereas in bats, you know, they are overexpressed before they see any danger signal. And we think of that to do with, you know, a uh, uh, rapid and efficient elimination of DNA damage reagent. But equally or more importantly is other hand is that bats have evolved, you know, very, very strongly to do everything to dampen certain 
over immune defense mechanism, you know. So the M2 mediate inflammasome, so double stranded DNA mediate inflammasome signaling, that whole pathway is gone because the, the sensor M2 is deleted. And the NAP3 mediate inflammasome is uh, really dampened, and the steam molecule is dampened. And then we had uh, made a bat mice, basically just like a baptized mice, like humanized mice. We transferred the bone marrow from bats into uh, immunodeficient mice. And then, uh, you know, uh, any immune system, if you do that, the mouse, you know, will develop this uh, 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 graft versus host disease, GVHD. And we, when we put a bat, at least one species of bat, the bone marrow get into it, the, bats, uh, the, the, the bat mouse was uh, healthy for 16 months, you know. So, and uh, very interesting, but I don't have time to go any of this, just to say that I give you two examples of elevated, uh, you know, uh, inner defense, and this is the ABC uh, transporter. So that's a published paper, basically cut the long story short, is that this is the, the protein on the cell membrane, uh, uh, surface and we all have it, but we don't express it. In humans only, you know, when, uh, if you have cancer and uh, you do uh, uh, cancer treatment and then become resistant, then this, this is overexpressed. The other more interesting story is a high base level expression of heat shield protein. You know, I still remember when I was doing my PhD, you know, uh, uh, in the early eighties, UC Davis, you know, heat shield protein was just discovered, right? It's accidentally because you shifted the culture to from 37 degree mammalian cell line culture to 40 degrees and you find a certain proteins, you know, very abundantly expressed. So it's called a heat shock proteins. But now we know that not only heat shock, other stress can induce, it's a stress shock proteins. So in bats, you know, what we've discovered, you know, as I said, that during flight, right, bats can sustain very high body temperature to all the way to 42 degrees. So the very simple experiment we did is incubated the cell line at a 37 and the 40 degrees. So so this is the, you know, uh, uh, BHK and the MDCK said, you know, so any non bat cell line, they die. I mean, you know that unless it's a mutant, you know, uh, primary cell all die. With bat cell line, you know, sustain there, okay? Whether it's kidney or lung. So if it's a bat cell line that they can really grow at 40 degrees, basically. So they have a, a way to be resilient with this uh, heat shock condition for all the other mammals. And then so uh, to just to prove that this is not unique for a single bat species, we did many different bat species, uh, two different bat species and many different heat shock proteins. So this is a real time PCR. As you can see, you know, the bats has a high basal level, you know, and uh, in different tissues. Not every heat shock protein is uh, have high basal level, but at least two for each bat species. And then we also, prove that, you know, at the protein level, you know, the HSP7090, as you can see in the muscles of bats versus the mouse, you know, mouse, you don't have this until you heat shock it. And, uh, and then to prove that the heat shock protein, the high basal level heat shock protein is responsible for this resilience, the heat resilience. And so what we did is uh, heat shock proteins are highly conserved. So this is a very essential protein. And if you CRISPR knockout, the cell will die. So we cannot do that. So we use SINA sort of translating, knock them down. And as you can see that once we knock down either uh, HSP70 or HSP90, now the bat cell behave just like other mammalian cell. They will die at 40 degrees. So basically the high basal level heat shock protein, the two major heat shock protein, HSP70 and 90, both are required for bats to exhibit that uh, resilience to, to the heat basically. And that's very essential because every night, their body temperature will get to the heat shock sort of a zone and they fly for many hours every night. So this is a physiology for them rather than sickness. So what, you know, today what I try to explain everything is in the context where why back. So I met, you know, uh, Matthew Shoulders from MIT. So Matthew is come from a chemical engineering department where he's very interested in the protein folding. So he has a system in human cells that he can manipulate these cells that the heat shock protein HSP7090, you know, can express the normal level or, you know, high overexpression or a reduced expression. Because heat shock proteins, one of the major function is a, a chevron, that they help a protein folding. So he defined this as hyperfolding and hypofolding. What he discovered is that use HIV and the flu virus, if you pass this uh, virus into these three different conditions, and he find that 
this is the condition that favor virus evolution because they can tolerate mutation much better and the virus can evolve faster. And uh, so this is really beautiful. So we have a collaboration with a group for, you know, in Bristol University, they use our bat cell line and they passed the Ebola virus. So basically, bats is a natural hyperfolding host because bats express the heat shield protein at a high base level. So that may explain bats are such a good reservoir that they allow the virus not only to exist, coexist, to live inside bats, but also allow them to really diverge and evolve, you know, because uh, heat shield protein may play a role there, you know. And then what we have is a dampened response to such sort of DNA. Uh, Double-strand DNA happened to be you know, one of the most dangerous signal in cells, right? So that's why in our body, we have lots of uh, uh, a safe, redundant mechanisms to sense this and to turn on immune system defense. And then in bats, you know, there are clearly you know, a, 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 a evolutionally disadvantaged to have a too sensitive DNA sensing uh, uh, mechanism. So they have evolved to the extreme of delete this IF16 and M2, so both are in the pyhene gene family, it's gone. And also the sting molecule is dampened. Okay, so the overall is really a dampened, you know. Uh, uh. So this is the paper, you know, again, it's open. This is the last also my former uh, postdoc, and now he's in Wuhan Institute, so he's a senior author. And we discovered that, you know, it's a really beautiful story. If you go through the sting molecules that you found that there are two important serum residues, one at a 358 and 366 it's absolutely conserved, required for its function in all mammals, unless we dig into bats. So this is the non-bat mammal from humans to horses, to pigs, to cats, to dogs, right? And here is the bat. So we went, you know, we tried to get as much CDN as possible. So we surveyed 31 different bat species of, uh, you know, suborders. So searing is absolutely required for bats, anything but searing at that residue, you know, position 356, Six, uh, 58. 366 is a concern, but this one, they cannot tolerate. So what that means is that now what we have is the reverse, right? So in, in the human scenarios, you know, this is what we use uh, herpes virus. Sting has some antiviral effect, right? So if you have white type sting, that it has a, a dampening uh, effect to control the viral replications, the viral load is low. If you change this serine 358 to alanine, now the virus level goes up, right? And uh, in bats, these are three different bat species. The white type maintain a high level of bats. And if you change this to serine, now you have a low level of uh, virus. So I think, again, this play a role in this uh, 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 making bats such a good reservoir for virus. Inflammation now, as I said, this is the most exciting discovery in our lab, you know, so inflammation is a double-edged sword, right? You know, when you are young, you're healthy, you can control your inflammation, get the balance right, and that's protective. Once you are over 50, 60, and then, you know, your control is not as uh, balanced, and then you go over inflammation, it becomes pathogenic. So inflammation and disease, you know, you guys, you know, uh, I mean, many of them, your medical sort of research, and I always say you can go from aging to Zika virus, A to Z, and uh, every, var every disease in between, whether it's cancer, it's uh, you know, diabetes, you know, uh, 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 neurologic disease, you know, Alzheimer's disease, inflammation play a very important role. And mostly it's because inflammation went over, out of control. So I don't have the time to go into a lot of details, but we have published a few papers and we just have one except that will come out very soon. And, uh, this is a human and mouse, so you need to have a priming followed by activation. And it's a, such an important process. So the activation process is you have a cascade of regulation. You can regulate at the sensor, you know, ASK1, caspase one and the R1 beta cleavage. So you have at least four to five different levels of regulation plus the priming. And in bats, we have identified six different mechanisms of dampening. So this is like an incredible story, you know, 65 bats have evolved every possible mechanism to make sure that process don't go over, okay? So I'm just going to give you one example that we published last year is uh, NIP3. So the NIP3, you need a uh, universe you know, uh, uh, priming and uh, 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 activation. So we, as we show here that 
uh, this is bats and this is a human. So the priming is dampened as well, but really the activation in you know, the human versus bats, sorry, the bats is in red. And uh, dampening in priming a little bit, but activation is, uh, there's a huge difference in terms of dampening. And uh, the mechanism is that, uh, you know, this molecule is a very big molecule. And uh, what we found that there's two possible variant. First of all, bat has two ATG codons. And also there's exon seven, you know, bats have uh, uh, two different possibility. You can have exon seven uh, 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 basically skipped out. And so we made these four different isoforms and cut the long story short, basically that to say the key is this uh, exon. So that when the exon seven is out, it's further dampening. But even with the exon seven that compared with human that uh, the NAP3 in bats are much less active, okay? So then we prove that by doing this hybrid, right? This is the human, this is bat, and we change these three different domains, you know, uh, the parine and nectar and the ARR domain. And we demonstrate the ARR domain is responsible for the dampening. And uh, so, but we don't have the residue yet, okay? So what's the implication of having a dampened, you know, inflammation is that uh, when you have virus infection like MERS, SARS, and we are doing COVID-19 now in bats. So we have proof already for most NASAs, and we have the data for COVID-19, is that if you subjected the human and the uh, bat PBMC to virus infection, uh, so this is a staining in a confocal. The, the green is stained for the spike protein to, just to measure the viral load. So as I said, you know, the antiviral status of bats and the human are similar. The virus replicate to similar levels. And then the middle one is the ASC uh, spec formation. So you have this tiny, really, a ten, intense red dot. You have, if you have this, means the inflammation has activated with viral infection. And for human PBMs, we know that you know most can activate that very strongly. But in bat PBMC, as you can see, very diffuse. We don't see a spec. So we you know quantify this that at least the activation is a log difference basically. So that again you know explains again that why bats carries virus but they don't get sick is because they don't go over inflamed uh, uh, immunopathology. So, you know, just like uh, the, the cell paper published, there was a, a, a commentary and uh, so Nature Micro also have this commentary on the bat tolerance to viral infections and uh, David Heyman, who is a scientist in this field. It's really a good summary to say, you know, for example, the life expectancy is a proportion to body mass for mouse and human, but bats is off the curve. And if you go through this six, inflammation and viral infection is off the curve. The only thing bats sort of obeys the rule of mammal is that, you know, the reproductive rate, right? Bats, you know, is not very reproductive. Mouse is much more reproductive. So, and the human is the least reproductive. So in terms of their life expectancy, a bats is in middle and the human is the longest and the, the mouse is here. So in summary, we have a, a better host defense tolerance balance in bats and that leads to slow aging, less prone cancer, less everything, you know. I mean, we are now, you know, uh, get into heart disease. I just have, a, we recruit a professor from in, Imperial College who is a cardiologist. We just started some a collaboration to study the bat heart and he was very, very amazed and he think that there's a lesson for us to learn. So this is what I try to, you know, emphasize. There's a, the peaceful who exists with virus and uh, there are lessons for us to learn. So I, as I said, I want to, you know, turn this, uh, the source of a virus into the source of uh, knowledge for human medical research. And I actually succeeded in doing that. In 2013, I won a major grant, a $10 million grant. The title of the grant is Learning from Bats. Basically, we say, you know, there's so much in bats we can learn, you know. Okay, so I finished up really trying to discuss something unique of our COVID-19, you know, especially, as I said, my area of research is look at the animal-human interface and uh, you know, uh, uh, tracing the reservoir and early transmission events. So spillover is a terminology we use for animal to human transmission. And now the term spill back basically is uh, human to animal transmission. You can call it the forward zoonotic transmission or reverse zoonotic transmission, it's just another name. As I said, you know, I'm a strong believer of serology, right? So I have been involved in the, you know, all these emerging zoonotic outbreak responses and uh, in terms of the animal reservoir and intermediate host, you know, my research always, always at serology. You know, these uh, four of them uh, play a role. And so 
when I was in Wuhan, you know, January 14th, when I got a sequence from my uh, colleagues and I knew that, you know, it's a novel coronavirus, I ran my lab to say, please order that gene, I want to do serology. And then very rapidly that from a concept to a pattern to launch a product and this paper all happened in 70 days. So we developed a, something called a surrogate virus neutralization. So this is a, still remain to be the only commercial test you can measure functional neutralizing antibody without using live virus or BSS3 or any cell. Basically, it's just a protein-protein interaction assay. I don't have the time to go there, but I just want to say why that's important because the spill back issue we're facing for COVID-19. So, I mean, you heard from the news now, you know, the mink farms in Europe and the USA really has suffered, you know, unfortunate event of uh, basically that uh, human pass the virus to animals, animal gets sick, die, and then they pass the virus to healthy farmers. But mink is not alone. We have evidence cats, dogs, and tigers at least have all been infected by human, you know, so infect human pass the virus to them. So in terms of wildlife, we're used to them as a natural reservoir, intermediate host, amplifier host, you know, for SARS, you know, for hanger nipper, you know, we, I, I play a role in identify this uh, functionality. But now we are really worried about this spear back and uh, what I have a new terminology called the unnatural natural reservoir, right? You know, this uh, natural animal wildlife, you know, live by themselves, no human intervention, no farm animals. But the way they become a reservoir potentially is very unnatural because the human passed the virus to them. So this is the very scary scenario we are, right? Bats, most likely bats in Asia, not necessarily in China, most likely is the reservoir. Passed to this animal X, it could be pangolin or some, something else, illegally traded in Wuhan and then passed to human and that's how we have the COVID-19. Human passed this to mink in many countries, many farms already, and a mink can pass this to human. So that's bad, but if that happens to farmed animals, at least these are all in a biosecure area and the worst scenario is you just have to, you know, uh, contain them, right? Slot them or do something. But what happens where you are in USA, we have bats, in Australia we have bats, in Europe we have bats, and we know some of the bats are actually susceptible to COVID-19, right? So if that into bats, and we know bats are good reservoir because they don't get sick, so even if you have the money to do surveillance, you will not go really to near all the bats. Because, and also bats, there are so many different species and so large number. So if they establish and then they mutate, right? I already say bats, you know, virus in bats evolve very, very comfortably and rapidly. And then they have many variants of uh, COVID-19 related virus. From time to time, they will spill over to other intermediate hosts and get human. Then that cycle is much more scary than right now, I think. So, there are this publication in The Economist just a few weeks ago, and Peter Daszak, you know, I mean, these are very big names in our field, who is the uh, CEO of the Eco Health Alliance, and uh, Jeremy Fry is the CEO of Wellcome Trust. Both are very, very adamant to say, yes, you know, we should continue to search for the origin of China, but if they want to have a bat, you know, if they have limited results, they, they will say they will go to Southeast Asia, where I am. The reason is that, the Chinese have done lots, lots of surveillance in the last 20 years, especially from uh, the Susan Lee's group, and they focus on this Yunnan province. And you look at the, the diversity of the bat species, the rhinoceros bats, which carries SARS-related virus, the dark color means more diverse and more uh, dense, right? So this area in Asia is much more high diversity. And so, you know, I think that I totally agree with them and I already start to search, use serology to lead and to look for animals in this area that carries neutralizing antibody for COVID-19. So I'd like to thank you know, my team. You know, so I have been doing this for the last 25 years and I have a large team. We passionately call ourselves the backpack in Australia. So this is the Aussie, uh, Aussie backpack. And now I have SG Singapore backpack. And I have to thank all these little cute guys. You know, this has really changed my career in terms of uh, studied bat virus and the bat immunology. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. So uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much for sharing your science with us. The questions from Lei, there are two questions. So the first one is, um, what's the mitochondrial function in the bats? Is it more powerful mitochondrial functions in bats? Yeah. This is a, this is a very, 
Very good question. The PhD student I hired to do is to do mitochondria, okay? But we found that, you know, uh, 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 to get back mitochondria really pure genomics is difficult. And then he accidentally found that ABCB1 transporter was more interesting. So he got a nature communication paper and a graduate, but we still haven't finished our mitochondria story. So I was talking about this uh, cardiologist, you know, from Imperial College just joined us. So he now is a, a mitochondria expert. I cannot reveal too much. Very interesting story. Basically, the mitochondria in bats is battle ready. They are stress ready. They arrange the way that they can really ramp up with this energy requirement and do all the immune function regulation. So I just stop there to say, yes, the bat mitochondria is uh, more powerful, more organized, and more battle ready. Yeah. So the second question is, how you check LPS level in human peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cell? Okay, so the LPS, I think over there in our, as a priming is really a experimental sort of a, a system, you know, uh, there are other things can prime that inflammasome. Okay, so we actually don't check, you know, the LPS level, yeah. In vitro, we do that. In vivo, we just do infection. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Nice talk, Dr. Wang. I, I was yeah. uh, uh, seeing that a lot of the comparison between the um, immune system and the heat shock response uh, was yeah. between human and bat and uh, the yeah. rodents, right? Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering about uh, um, like how much are, are we sure about the, the larger uh, mammal, cat, dogs, cow, pig, which yeah. each have their own coronavirus species, right? So is the idea yeah. that their immune system is actually more close to the human and the rodent? And, uh, yeah. They, when they get coronavirus, they get very sick and that's why they don't, you know, translate yeah, that yeah, much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a good question. Definitely, you know, so far, you know, I'm not an expert in heat shock proteins, but if you go through this, you know, bats are unique. All the other uh, mammals, the heat shock proteins, that it's really a, a stress shock protein. And, uh, and uh, so what we're trying to say is uh, not heat shock protein is required to maintain the, the, the coronavirus. It's just that that favors bats to be a better reservoir for coronavirus and the other virus as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So since we only have limited time, so now we have to move to Trinity roundtable. So for yeah. Trinity is for already re registered for the roundtable, please just stay in the same room. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right.